everybody. We're going to get started here in just a minute. We're going to give some time for everybody to join. If you have any comments, make sure to leave them in the uh, in the chat, and we'll try to save some time at the end of our presentation here to uh, address them. So, like I said, we'll just give it another minute. Hope everybody's enjoying all the sessions today. Like I say, just getting started here in a moment. Hang tight. Give it another 30 seconds or so, and we will get started. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, we are going to have a great presentation coming up. It is, uh, the title is Locationless API Management with Red Hat 3 Scale and Red Hat Service Interconnect. I've got Vamsi here, who's going, who I'm going to turn it over to. Go ahead, Vamsi. Thanks, Greg. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vamsi Ravla, Principal Technical Marketing Manager here at Red Hat. Uh, I focus on technologies related to API management, app connectivity, and, uh, you know, app foundations, application services, everything uh, that is related to app development at Red Hat and uh, I have been with Red Hat for the past seven, almost eight years now. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's been a fantastic ride. And uh, I'm excited to present uh, the concept of locationless API management to all of you today. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully have some good discussions towards uh, the end of our session. So if, if at any point, just, just a couple of checks, if at any point something is not visible, something is not audible, Feel free to, you know, uh, put it out the chat or uh, Greg will also come out of mute if something's not visible and, and let me know. So uh, let, let us know if, if there is some technical glitch and uh, we'll sort it out uh, in the middle of the session. Okay, with that said, let's jump into the actual content of the today. So what we'll discuss today is, uh, you know, first we'll discuss an introduction to API management. Uh, you know, some of you or majority of you know have heard about API management for, for but for the benefit of others who've not, uh, uh, you know, heard about it or, or are a little confused about the topic, uh, we'll do a quick intro. Some challenges with the existing solutions or some uh, restrictions that current vendors uh, uh, pose with respect to API management and introduction to the concept of locationless API management. Uh, the need for it and how Red Hat addresses it, the demo use cases, and and so on and so forth. And uh, as w once once we go into the middle of the session today, you will actually see a live demo. Uh, pray pray to the demo gods, right? That everything goes well. But uh, uh, you'll see a live demo on how we achieve uh, what we call locationless API management. So with that said, let's uh, jump into the session. So. We know that you know APIs are like a nervous system to all the businesses today, right? Every company that uses technology today does APIs in some form or the other, and APIs have become super critical to every business or soon every business, right? Uh, businesses that don't do APIs today, at some point will start building technology and uh, you know start adopting or building APIs, wanting to share them etc so apis are fundamental are just not a technical construct but are also very fundamental to every business out there and very important from a business point of view too customers and partners you know uh, depend on it a lot of customers use the apis of your technology or product to do different functionalities partner use your apis to you know deliver value added uh, features or value added functions uh, and, and uh, APIs essentially help your product become a platform, uh, you know, 
by the value add services that partners provide and also gives flexibility to your customers to you know add their own things on top of uh, what you actually offer when you expose your apis to customers and like i mentioned it is fundamental to achieve for a company to be, uh, apis are really fundamental for a company to become agile competitive and uh, like i mentioned right uh, it it is the foundation for a product for any technology to become an ecosystem or a platform and apis are our key there and a lot of web and mobile apps depend on apis so anything that you do uh even we mostly know right if you are attending this and we are technical to a certain extent but almost all products that we interact today have uh, are interacting with some kind of uh, apis so uh, just wanted to uh you know talk through this slide about uh, to set up the stage for how important apis are uh, but uh, when you when you think about APIs, right? It's 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 not just about oh I've created an API. I mean the slide says HTTP REST endpoints, but but it could be HTTP gRPC or anything. Uh, 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 so any 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 of your APIs, right? It's it's not just about oh I've created the API, I've exposed it, I'm done. Uh, I, I, my job is done. It's it's not just that, right? Creating and uh, you know ex offering the API is just the start. You need to think about a lot of things such as security and authentication. How do I secure my API? Uh, the what type of security? What type of authentication do? Is it a key based authentication? Is it a Open ID Connect based authentication? What are the different versions? How do I do? Uh, uh, a versioning of my API and what is the SLA behind different APIs? Documentation, if somebody wants to use my API, how will they learn about my API without you know, reaching out to the engineering team directly? The documentation uh, is, is very important. A portal or a developer portal where if you're exposing your APIs externally or internally or even internally to other teams, uh, uh, there should be a self-service portal where people can sign up to your APIs. You know, look at the documentation, look at the usage of the APIs, etc. Uh, you know, uh, more things such as reliability policies. Uh, you know, header modification, authorization using JWT tokens, uh, rerouting, etc. All such policies uh, are also something you need to think about. Testing, metering, and billing. If if you want to monetize your APIs, you need to think about metering and billing alerts if based on usages downtimes of apis uh, you know the whole life cycle management access control so all these things are something you need to think about when you're thinking about oh i need to create an api and expose it to say my customers and partners but it's it's just not that and all these things are something you need to think about and that is where api management really shines right api management covers majority of the issues for you in a single offering and uh, that's why it's so important that you have an api management tool uh, today especially if you are planning to build out a, a very strong api program because it, it covers a lot of uh, uh, a lot of aspects that that this slide shows under under the iceberg right like it's it's just uh, uh, you know, exposing is just the tip of the iceberg, but it covers a lot of aspects uh, under that are covered by API management. So again, uh, this session, uh, just, just to give a heads up, I'm not going to do a deep dive into API management as such, because I've assumed people who've come to this session know or have heard about API management or are using API management. I'd rather, uh, you know, uh, you know, drill down into a specific aspect of API management, right? So API management at a 10,000 feet view is, uh, excuse me, just uh, something I need to check. All right, sorry, that was a simple technical glitch, but uh, so API management at a 10,000 feet view is, you know, you have typically a data plane, which is your API gateway and API backend together. And then you have a, control plane, which is your API manager, who takes care of all the documentation, portal, monetization, analytics, et cetera. So uh, typically, most of the API management platforms are divided into these two aspects, like the control plane and the data plane. And today's session, we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on the, the data plane and specifically the connectivity between the API backend and your API gateway and your API management platform, right? How 
how do we achieve this connectivity? What are the challenges or the restrictions that current uh, uh, vendors that current vendors provide? Uh, and sorry, I just have to close my chat because it keeps uh, pinging. Uh, sorry about that, but that current vendors, uh, the challenges that current vendors, uh, uh, the challenges that we have with current solutions and how locationless API management tries to solve that, right? So let's, uh, so again, long story short, this is not going to be a deep dive into API management, but more about the connectivity aspect and uh, how how restrictive some of the solutions are. So if you if you look at uh, if you look at the current approach, uh, some of the vendors today will ask you to deploy the gateway in the same environment of APIs so that you know uh, the APIs are easily discovered by the API gateway. Because you know the you do not you only want the only public exposure for your APIs that you need is through the API gateway. You do not want to expose your API backend first publicly and then add that to the gateway and then expose it through the gateway. So some some uh, some kind so, uh, a common pattern is people deploying the gateway in the same pattern of API so that they don't they can access them locally within that uh, environment and they don't need to create any public URLs for the API and the only access point externally would be through the gateway. And that's kind of very restricting in, in a lot of ways, right? Because again, if you want to deploy your API backend somewhere else other than the gateway, or if your API gateway is not compatible in certain environments where you want to build your API, it kind of restricts you. The other thing is some of the vendors today force you to uh, you know, build APIs using their proprietary vendor runtime. Um, so for example, they say, oh, you have to use our platform to build your APIs so that you know you can manage your APIs using our API management platform. And that is again super restricting today, right? Because you know um, one, you don't get the choice to build APIs in the language of your choice and the environment of your choice and you're seriously restricted by the vendor who says, um, use our runtime or our uh, specific scripting languages. Otherwise, your API, our API management platform will not be able to manage your APIs. And the third challenge that, again, some of the vendors ask you to do is, you know, in order for your, in order for your API to be discovered or managed by our API gateway and the platform, you need to publish your APIs to an exchange. I mean, that exchange could be a public exchange or a private exchange managed by the vendor, but it's a managed, it's it's a mandatory thing that uh, you know uh, it's a mandatory thing that some vendors push you to you know publish the api to a certain vendor exchange for uh, apis to be managed by the gateways and again that is that is super restrictive right you don't want to you know maintain another piece uh, of architecture or publish your apis to another exchange and and you are super restricted by you know, the conditions that uh, the vendor uh, poses you. So uh, you want to have a lightweight environment and not have an extra piece in your infrastructure like this, such as the vendor exchange. Or if it's a public exchange, you don't want to, you know, publicly expose your APIs uh, also. So that's, that's another challenge. And uh, finally, uh, you know, if you really want, if you really want the flexibility, say you're deploying your API, back in, in in different environments uh, and you want your api gateway to you know uh, discover your api backends uh, as if they're in the local network you have to set up complex vpns firewalls vpcs uh, between the apis and api gateways which which are which is a good solution but a very time consuming very complex. Again, the development teams are restricted by the velocity of the networking teams, and uh, it, it really restricts the speed at which uh, you know uh, uh, you know the API teams can progress because you know they have to reach out to the networking teams about okay, uh, can you set up a VPN between my API gateway and API backend? Then you have to give a business reasoning, etc. And and it's VPNs, uh, VPCs, firewalls are not that easy to. Um, you know, configure right. So these are the challenges 
that uh, the current existing solutions or restrictions uh, you know pose you with in terms of giving you the flexibility to deploy your apis anywhere in order to be managed by the api gateway and uh, and that's where uh, you know uh, the concept of locationless api management comes in right so what is locationless api management let's go to the definition so locationless api management epitomizes a parent Digmatic evolution endowing organizations with the liberty to orchestrate API deployments devoid of geographical constraints. This transformative approach seamlessly accommodates the whole definition, right? And uh, I'll give you a minute to read this. Not a minute, I'll give you 10 seconds to go through this. And then after reading this, you know, after completing saying the imperatives of operational flexibility within the sophisticated tapestry of modern API governments, you'll be thinking, what in the world is this guy talking about? And why is this definition so complex? I, actually, this is a made up definition. I wanted to make it as complex as possible just for the you know, heck of it. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually not, not the actual definition of API management. But uh, what in the world is locationless API management? And uh, why should it be very simple and not as complicated as this definition uh, that we see here, right? So, so what is locationless API management? So locationless API management means, you know, you should be able to manage your APIs distributed across multiple clouds and clusters without any restrictions by the vendor. So for example, you have your APIs that uh, are deployed in AWS. Your APIs are deployed on Red Hat OpenShift, on GCP, on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, VMs, demilitarized zones, mainframes, legacy systems. What, wherever your APIs might be residing, your API management platform or the API managers and the gateway should be able to discover and access your APIs without any trouble. And you should have the flexibility to deploy your APIs uh, without compromising on the functionalities of API management. That is a key, key feature of a uh, key, key aspect of locationless API management. And the other aspect of locationless API management is, you know, to reduce the complexity and increase the visibility of your APIs. Because as I mentioned, uh, you know, one of the complexities of public facing API management is, you know, you've seen the challenges that we've seen with vendors, you know, like, using the appropriate return on times, using vendor exchanges, building complicated VPNs, firewalls, or sometimes exposing the API using a public URL externally and just praying to God that, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, nobody discovers it and just add that URL to your API management platform. So there's a lot of complexities uh, involved in public facing API management. And then uh, locationless API management seeks to reduce that and you'll see how that is. And the other aspect of locationless API management is to create discovery of your APIs easy and create a single pane of visibility for your APIs scattered across different environments through your API management platform. So those are the key aspects of API management, locationless API management, right? One is the flexibility to deploy APIs everywhere and then at the same time, increase the discoverability and reduce the complexity of your public facing uh, uh, APIs. So now that we have an understanding or a high level understanding of what uh, uh, locationless API management uh, seeks to achieve. What is the real need for it? So uh, there's there's a lot of things that you can talk about, but I think these are the key things, right? One is compliance. For example, say you the 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 government regulate that you are you reside in a country where the government regulates you to you know deploy your API only closer to where the data sits and the API should not be deployed anywhere else except for uh, uh, that region. But your API management platform is, is in some other region and uh, uh, it, it creates a challenge for you. So uh, in that case, is locationless API, the need for locationless API management is, is uh, super important. So you have your uh, API management wherever it is and you have your uh, 
uh, APIs and databases uh, close to each other in the regions that are approved by the regulatory body and then you can you can create that connectivity using uh, you know what we'll, we'll call locationless api management again data residency regulations uh, you know gdpr is another example but that's that's uh, that's one of the primary needs for locationless api management and another thing is security i mean security is is common for api management in general but it's more so important for locationless API management because you know you have uh, diverse environments that uh, and your APIs are dispersed across different environments because you know uh, you know in large large organizations people like to deploy APIs uh, in I mean you have different teams and each team likes to deploy APIs in different environments and uh, you know the security aspect of how your APIs communicate with the API management platform and the communication and the transfer of uh, data between these two platforms should be protected and uh, pro should protect all the sensitive data, right? So uh, it, it's even more important uh, when you're talking about dispersed APIs, the security aspect uh, becomes very important. And finally, costs. Uh, for example, if, you, if there is a situation where you cannot move your data to say, to say to say to a cloud or a platform where your api management resides just because of the costs involved or if you want to move your apis to a cheaper uh, a, a cloud vendor where you have certain uh, discounts but your api and, and you're you and you're using api gateway from from some other uh, vendor who doesn't support on that cloud what would you do so all these things are called for uh, i mean call for the need for a concept like locationless API management that gives you the flexibility uh, uh, to deploy and, and uh, you know, helps you achieve compliance and security. So how do we go about locationless API management? Uh, or rather, how does uh, Red Hat try to achieve this? So before, uh, and this is where, uh, you know, hopefully the fun part and the interesting demo comes into picture, right? But uh, uh, before I actually go into the demo, I'll talk about a couple of products uh, from Red Hat that we use in the demo so that you understand what, what we are using for, uh, for what here, and then you can, uh, we, can, we can dive into the details of the demo. So the two components that we'll be using in our demo today is Red Hat 3 Scale API Management. It is a complete API management platform, which again, like I showed earlier, has uh, uh, two, two different, two key uh aspects right one is the data plane and the control plane the data plane is uh you know if you can see my mouse pointer here or let me get a laser yeah if you can see the mouse pointer here this is the api gateway is the data plane and the api manager is a control plane so the api gateway mostly is concerned about you know your uh, consumer api consumer apps making requests and uh, it authenticates with say using an api key or say open id connect single sign on using single sign on tools such as that's i mean uh, single sign on key cloak etc and once once it is authorized it it goes to the api backend and returns data to your api consumers or developer apps that you have and because the data travels through this and the requests and response travel through the gateway uh, we call it the data plane and the control plane is the api manager itself which covers a lot of aspects uh, such as you know the admin portal the admin portal is where you know as an api provider you can control uh, uh, you can look at the analytics and billing of your api you can uh, manage the keys of uh, the developers who are using your api say a developer has left an organization or no longer using and using your api or, or his plan or subscription has expired. You how to delete the keys? Uh, uh, a CMS management for the developer portal uh, and and a dashboard to have a view of all the APIs that they are managing. And a developer portal again uh, is a part of uh, the API man manager, which will provide you, uh, you know, where you can provide documentation, a self service self sign up mechanism for your api consumers um, active docs where you can look at the documentation try samples of your api so that it can, developer portal helps you expose your apis externally or i mean outside your team or outside your organization 
and creates uh, an option for self sign up uh, for uh, api consumers that can you know sign up for the apis get the keys and uh, you know look at the analytics of the apis request chat with the api providers if they have some concerns etc and because this is all related to you know controlling the aspects of api management and and uh, um, the the whole concept of api management we call it the control plane so the api gateway and the API gateway is the data plane. The API manager, which contains the admin portal, developer portal, is the control plane. So that that's one component that we'll be using in the demo today. And the other component is, you know, Red Hat Service Interconnect. So Red Hat Service Interconnect is again a very important aspect and actually what enables locationless API management. Right? It is a layer seven. Uh, uh, you know addressing connectivity tool that red hat provides uh, basically if if you want uh, if you want to connect to services that are deployed across platforms uh, to a service if you want to connect services that are deployed across two different environments without creating vpns uh, and without using ip addresses Service Interconnect is your answer uh, because it uses layer seven addressing. Uh, it, instead of routing IP packets between network endpoints, it uses the service names or uh, application addresses uh, to route the messages uh, between the routers that it installs in those different environments. And the interaction between these routers is, uh, you know, it's 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 mutual TLS encrypted, so it is super secure, and uh, you know it's and the access to the granularity of individual services and endpoints is is what you know it 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 really shines it because you know you want to connect two services and not two you know say for example not two Kubernetes clusters or not a VM and a cluster you only want to connect the services within those environments and that is what Red Hat Service Interconnect helps you achieve. Uh, with the layer seven addressing, and uh, you know it helps you go granular to the individual service endpoints. And there is no implicit trust granted based on physical or network location. What I mean by that is, you know, if if two things are in the same network, there is no implicit trust. You have to using Red Hat Service Interconnect, you have to explicitly give permission for uh, one service to access the other service. You know, by by uh, uh, you know exchanging certificates and establishing the connection and it is agnostic uh, of the environments ip versions and that's why it enables the portability of your applications uh, so red hat service interconnect and three scale is what we'll be seeing in our demo today and uh, now let's jump into the demo part i'll be not i'll not be looking at the camera for some time because i'll be looking at my screen when i'll be doing the demo so if i Again, if there is something that you can't see or if you can't listen, just ping me and uh, I should be able to do that. All right, so currently, uh, here's the situation, right? So we have three different environments where we'll deploy, uh, you know, a Quarkus API, uh, a Node.js API, and uh, so the Quarkus API will be on OpenShift on Azure or on Azure. In our case, in this demo, and uh, the Node.js API will be on a RHEL virtual machine, and I've deployed three scale API management on OpenShift on AWS. So all these environments are not connected, and now what we'll do is the the APIs that you see here, the Quarkus API and the Node.js API that, that are deployed in different environments, three scale will be able to discover them and manage them without any public exposure for these APIs using local OpenShift services. And let's see how to achieve that. So if you, before that, I'd like to show something, right? Uh, uh, if you, so what happens is if, if your API, uh, if you recollect what we've spoken about uh, in the challenges section, uh, one aspect is if your API and your gateway are deployed, the, the simple solution is, you know, your API and your API, your API gateway and your API is being deployed in the same environment. So with three scale, uh, what happens is if you, if the API is deployed in the same cluster as three scale, 
you can Threescale automatically discovers the API. So for example, uh, so for example, I have a I have a a payment processor API here that is deployed on the same cluster as Threescale. As you can see, I've deployed Threescale in the same cluster here, and uh, I've deployed the the payment processor in the same cluster again. And if you see Threescale with some certain permissions is able to you know discover that api within automatically because you know uh, it's deployed in the same openshift platform now obviously we've given some explicit permissions for three scale to discover that and uh, three scale is able to do that but uh, that's that's not what we want right we want our apis to be in different uh, uh, different environments not in the same uh, cluster as three scale and uh, three scale in spite of doing that with locationless API management, three scale should be able to discover your APIs irrespective of wherever they are. And let's see how how we would achieve that. So uh, again, uh, I, what what I'll try to do is I'll try to uh, you know copy paste some of the commands because again you know with the demos with the spin, uh, single spelling errors anything can go wrong. So what I'll do first here is you know first let's try and uh, the green color one. As you can see here, the green color one is my AWS cluster. Blue is Azure, uh, open, uh, where I've installed OpenShift. And the orange color terminal is for the RHEL VM, where we'll uh, deploy our Node.js app. So first, uh, let's deploy. First, let's deploy the Quarkus app on our Azure cluster. So let's see that. I'm going to the Quark, the Quarkus app is basically it'll uh, this this will create an API which will list which will show you a list of fruits here. Uh, as you can see, it's it's a little bit blurred, but it'll show you a list of fruits. That's our Quarkus API. I've created simple APIs so that uh, you know you uh, understand. Uh, you can see the difference between the, the the APIs that are deployed in different environments. So uh, the APIs deployed in the Azure environment uh, will show, display a list of fruits and their description. And let's also install a Node.js API in our RHEL machine. As you can see, the orange terminal is our RHEL machine. And uh, if you're wondering what these terminals are, again, I've logged. Uh, the Node.js app here. Again, I'm, I'm deploying it as a container using Podman uh, uh, here, but but you can also deploy natively on Open uh, on on RHEL. Uh, uh, Red Hat Service Interconnect doesn't uh, doesn't matter for Red Hat Service Interconnect to create the connectivity if it's a container or not. So uh, let's let's give a few seconds for our APIs to get deployed. And uh, there you go. So let me just open up another tab here. Let me just open up another window for our REL machine. All right, me. Let me just create another tab because you know the server is running here. I want to run certain commands on it. And uh, let's try to run that. And I'll try to log into my rel machine again. I'm going to SSH into my rel machine. Just give me a second. There you go. I'm going to blow up the screen a little bit again. And let's also add the color to it so that we Yes, so our APIs are running in, in, uh, in the rel environment. We have our API running in OpenShift. Let me try to minimize this a bit so that it's, it's visible here. Yes, I think, sorry about the, the minor glitch, but I hope everything sorted out. All right, so we have our API running in rel and we have our API running in the Azure environment. Let me just clear this up so that this goes to the top of it. 
and let's try to see uh, if our APIs are running. So let me go to the Azure cluster here. This is our Azure cluster, which is running our Quarkus API. So it, it currently has a public route, which I'm going to delete. So as you can see, the Quarkus API here displays a list of routes. So what I am going to do now is I'm going to go to the public route and say delete route so that our API is not exposed to the internet at all because that was a premise. And then you see, we've removed uh, the access. So this, so our API is currently only visible to services within this cluster and nothing outside. So what I'll, what I'll do now is, uh, and and let's also double check our uh, uh, you know rel our node.js api deployed in rel if it's working right let's go ahead and do that and as you can see you can see a list of books authors i mean i've just given sample names here but book 1 book 3 book 2 book 3 and ids of the books so as you can see here our both both our apis are working so now what we'll do is we'll create a layer 7 network between these environments and and try try to discover these APIs in three scale. So first, in the I'll initialize my scupper router uh, uh, in the AWS environment. And I'll just wait for it to run. Now we've initialized Red Hat Service Interconnect Router there. Scupper is the open source name and the command line uses uses that and let's create a token that we use to establish the connection here give it a second while it creates the token uh -oh. the token's written and uh, now let's initialize the router in the Azure environment. So Scupper in it will initialize routers in both the environments that will create the connectivity between this, the layer seven connectivity between both these environments. So I'm initializing the router in the Azure environment. And if you see here, uh, the token that I created, if you want to have a look, uh, it has the details about the connections and uh, whatnot that we'll use. So I just wanted you guys to have a look at the token. Can't go into detail uh, about it. So let's create the link now using that token. So you can, uh, because I've logged into both the clusters using the same machine, the token is in the same terminal. But if you are typically, you'll, you'll want to transfer the token from one environment to the other, and uh, the token transfer is the, you know, uh, the token is the most important uh, part for your connectivity. So scupper link create. So I'm trying. To, I'm creating the link using the token now from the Azure cluster. And it says site configured uh, link to this. And then I'm going to expose like like I, like like we discussed earlier. Red Hat Service Interconnect will expose the services explicitly you have to explicitly say red hat service interconnect to expose these services uh, um, you know the ex red hat service interconnect to expose these services otherwise you know even if the connection is created the service uh, the service won't be exposed over the network so i'm going to expose the services Right. So now we've exposed the services and uh, let's also create the connection between the AWS cluster and our rel machine because that's where our other API uh, resides, right? So let's go and create that token first again because we already initialized the router. We don't need to do it again. So let's go ahead and uh, create the token there. Wait for it to create the token. The token is written and let's go check if the token is created. Good. And let's initialize the router in our rel VM. Uh, okay. I know what's. Sorry. Uh, 
-hmm. Just check, like I mentioned there. The demo gods are not with us, I guess. So let me just let me just do a simple configuration here. Exports, covers, page, platform, Podman. And now it should work. It, it's we have to basically tell Scupper should it is it connecting to a Kubernetes cluster or is it a Podman based router, right? So I have done that. And just waiting for it to initialize. Cool, now that we have the router initialized, let's go ahead and create our secret token here. Let's go ahead and create a file for the token. Again, I'm transferring the token from the AWS cluster to the rel VM here. I'm copying the token. I'm going to paste the token here, save the token, and now let's create the link. And once we've created the link, remember we have to explicitly say Red Hat Service Interconnect to expose this over the network so that 3Scale can discover it. I've created the scupper expose command, and then we have to create a corresponding virtual service in uh, uh, AWS for it to discover. Right, so so what we have done here is uh, I want to show it to you through the pictures. So we had three different environments, and then we created a layer seven network connectivity using the three different environments here. Uh, connected the Quarkus API, Node.js API, uh, and uh, to to the OpenShift cluster on uh, three scale API management. And then when you expose the services, uh, it creates virtual services on the OpenShift cluster where three scale is deployed. These are not the actual services, but virtual services that uh, you know route back to the actual uh, APIs deployed in you know our rel VM and uh, you know our Azure cloud. And then once you do that, if you label the services, um, if you label a service and and give this as true, three scale should be able to discover, which we will do right now, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, you know label our services i again have a bunch of commands that will label it first i'm going to label the, the quarkus api again uh, labeling and annotations are super useful especially if you are uh, uh, you want to you know do it as a part of your gitops uh, uh, process right because you know if you want to expose an api directly labeling the api should uh, should help you out so with that, uh, I think we are set. Let's go ahead and check in three scale if you are able to discover our API. And as you see in the APIs project, now you have a payment processor API, which was already there on the same cluster, but you have a Node.js API, Quarkus API that, that are already deployed. So let's go ahead and create the Node.js API and see if it works. And let's go ahead and create the Quarkus API and see if that works too. So the Node.js API that we have here, if you see the backend of the API here, backend is upstream URL. It is a local OpenShift address and not a public address. And let's go ahead and create an application plan, which is like the plan for your API, uh, for, uh, uh, API consumers to access your APIs and let's create an API consumer who will be allocated a key and then let's try to make a, a call to the API and see if it works. Create application and uh, let's go to our Node.js API integration, configuration and then let's see if it's we are able to call it through our gateway now. And uh, I think the endpoint is books, right? There you go. So now we are able to access an API that is deployed uh, outside the, the OpenShift cluster without exposing it publicly and without creating complex VPNs through the gateway. And our three scale API management platform was able to auto discover 
these APIs. And uh, the same case for Quarkus API, I don't want to repeat the, the whole thing, but it's going to be the same case for Quarkus API. Uh, I, I was planning to show a load balancing uh, use case, but I am not sure about the time. Uh, do we have enough time, Greg, to show one more use case here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. So yeah, I'll 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 go ahead and show one more use case and then uh, close off with a couple of slides, right? So so another aspect of locationless API management using three scale and scuffer is you know, it's it's not just uh, you know discoverability of your APIs like I showed here. And you go import from OpenShift, you can uh, you know auto discover your APIs irrespective of where they are deployed. It will also create high avail. You can also create high availability of your APIs using the uh, service interconnect network. Uh, uh, using the service interconnect network, and and you can use the same uh, service address. So you can we'll do this by creating the direct connection between uh, uh, our AWS cluster. Let's create a token here. And I'm just going to run commands quickly here so that, you know, and I'm going to install the, you know, the, the books API in my Azure cluster now. And create new token. All right, there's some there's some error that is uh, that that is happening here, but uh, I think that's since the token is already created, I think I can I can go ahead and uh, expose the service. And uh, if I kill. If I kill my container on rel, my API should still be working. That's that is that is the whole concept of this. Uh, yeah, here it is. So my API should still be working. See, I've killed the container in rel, deployed it on Azure, and didn't make any other changes. I just added the same uh, application address to it, and and everything started. Uh, it the, the whole high availability and load balancing scenario worked as expected. So. Uh, that's that's what I wanted to cover, and from a security standpoint, I covered uh, these aspects already. You know, all the connections are secured by mutual TLS. You know, and each network is compartmentalized. You can you can only expose the services that uh, you can only expose the services that are uh, that you want to, and all the services that are part of the namespace are not by default exposed over the network. You can avoid certain security pitfalls and complexities arriving from L3 networking complexity. And if you don't need this network at some point, all you need to do is run a scupper delete command and the whole network is stored down. And that's that makes it so ephemeral that you know if you are if you're deprecating an API, you can you can you know easily tear down that network. And some of the use cases and applications are uh, you know of locationless API management is one thing is mergers and acquisitions. When uh, company A acquires company B, they have to have, and they want to use a single API management platform, but both these companies have APIs deployed across different environments. Uh, that's, that's when locationless API management is super useful. Uh, for cost reduction, if you want to optimize costs by strategically deploying APIs in regions with lower infrastructure costs without the restrictions that your API management uh, vendor uh, uh, you know provides you with you can locationless API management again is super helpful again if you have legacy APIs uh, that that are immovable but you know you can't deploy your API management platform uh, in the same environment as your legacy APIs, you can uh, really use uh, locationless API management. So that uh, brings me to the end of the session. I think uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, in the meantime, these are a couple of learning resources if you're interested in Red Hat Service Interconnect. 
uh, you can scan the QR code and uh, it'll, it'll take you to some learning paths that uh, you can you can try out. Thank you so much, Vamsi. Um, I don't see any questions. If you want to leave that screen up just for another maybe 30 seconds so the audience can uh, pull out their phones and pull up their cameras and do their thing with the QR code. There's some great resources there. Uh, I would encourage you to you know, take a minute to open a couple browsers and refer back to them later. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. We will be uh, sharing the recordings of these sessions uh, here in the next couple of weeks. There's a lot of sessions, so we've got to kind of organize it and we'll we'll get a get a link out. And as I said in the beginning, there will be a link that will be uh, or these will be posted up in our developers YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of weeks. So. Have a great rest of your day and uh, look forward to the next session. Uh, we're not done with the day. So uh, hang tight and we will be back shortly with the next session. Thanks, Greg. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vamsi.